My first contact with a classics text was a classics comic, I think. Um, around the same time, I would have also been encountering through uh, my parents' upbringing uh, and, and my, my parents bringing me up in the Catholic Church. So it was on the one hand, exposure through the Catholic Church to, uh, to texts like the Gospels that I knew had a history and you know, were written in these ancient languages that no one spoke anymore. Uh, and that's not a religious tradition I'm a part of now, but it did shape my first seven or eight years in school. So uh, I went to a parochial school, so there was that. But at the same time, I was reading uh, a stack of comics that my grandmother kept in her little summer camp, which was basically a cabin on a lake in Massachusetts, moldering away a stack of classics comics, uh, including the Iliad. So that was, that was part of my kind of five, six, seven-year-old exposure to classics as well. But I had, I think, going to school in the 70s, I had exposure to the, to the post-50s and 60s education of, of my teachers that incorporated a fair amount of Joseph Campbell-style exposure to mythology. So uh, learning about the Greek and Roman gods and goddesses, reading Bullfinch's mythology when I was a little kid, that was very much part of um, the lingua franca when I was in, in grammar school. Um, so that the mythology as well as, as movies too. Um, Ben-Hur I think was my favorite movie when I was a kid, and I bet I'm not the, the only classicist to admit with some blushing that it had more of an impact on my visual picture of what the ancient world looked like. Um, and of course that's a really seductive picture, so full of exotic luxury and um, all kinds of things that as academics you learn to think about very critically, but as a kid you're just wowed by. My family was interested in old movies in a, in a special way, so that gave a special inflection, I think, to my, my experience uh, and, and my exposure to mythology in the, in the grammar school classroom. I think the, uh, the glamour of the Mediterranean and uh, my, my mother in particular really wanted to travel there when I was a kid and I, she had been there when she was in college and wanted to take me and my sister there. So that, there was a little extra intensity I would say in the way I was, I thought of ancient Greece and Rome as worthy of attention part of the culture that I was growing up with in the United States in the late 20th century, um, but also a place that, you know, one would go as a tourist and see beautiful things and see the architecture and the art that shaped Western civilization. Well, looking back on it now, I realize that I was growing up in a, in a fairly socially conservative milieu in New England that was reacting against the, the social changes of the 60s and 70s, and so it was it was a very self-protective and, and culturally conservative move, I think, on the part of the teachers who were educating me, my own family, um, the, the idea that Western civilization, capital W, capital C, had to be preserved and protected uh, was a central value I think I grew up with that I only learned you know, to think critically about and to question the history of as I got into college and then into graduate school. So while I have now a pretty complicated view about that upbringing and the, the baggage that came with it, the political baggage that came with it, I can't say I'm sorry to have grown up with it because I wouldn't be the person I am now without it.